So I was 10 months old when I learned how to walk and talk. And my parents told me that around the age of two, my very favorite thing was to open and close doors all the time. And that probably should have been a warning to them about how my life was going to turn out. I was the kind of kid that liked to walk to school reading two books simultaneously. And I read everything that I could get my hands on. I was totally in love with stories, and by the time I became an exchange student at 17, I had already been to the real world and many imaginal worlds in the stories in my books. But I didn't learn about the power of story, and I didn't see it myself until 30 years later, when I was at the first international storytelling festival in New Zealand called the Glistening Waters International Storytelling Festival. It took place in a boys' school, so if you can imagine a bunch of adults sitting at those kind of school benches listening to a really wonderful storyteller. He told a story that was incredibly moving, and people were visibly moved. And at the end of it, I was shaken. I asked myself, what happened there? And then immediately the second thing, I wonder if I could do that. So I spent a very long time in the library on the 398.2 shelf, which is folk tales, fairy tales, myths, and legends. I collected all of those, I kind of like this, and I told them all as well. But I quickly realized I wasn't destined to be a children's storyteller. And so I had to wait for my profession, which is facilitation, hosting group process, to meet up with my love of stories. In 2003, this is interesting, in 2003, uh, people were very interested in organizational storytelling. And so I joined that group of people interested in organizational storytelling, and I learned a lot of methods that had story as their basis. I began to use those kind of things, but in 2004, life gave me another challenge. When the house I was living in for the past seven years was sold, I followed that still small voice inside of me that said, lighten up and get ready to go. Go where, I said. But I started the practice of intentional nomading, first by traveling around with a, a stuff in my car, and then finally coming down to one suitcase, going wherever life called me to be. So I became a story catcher, picking up stories in one place and taking them to the next place where they were needed. I honed my listening skills. I became what they would call in Japan the sacred witness. I had to learn how to trust that the stories I was carrying in kind of my invisible basket would be exactly the nourishment the next group needed somewhere down the road. It wasn't until I saw an interview with Cliff Curtis, who is a New Zealand actor, where he said, storytelling, anybody who's involved in storytelling is an activist. And I went, yeah, that's me. I'm a story activist. But what does that mean? I say it means working with stories for positive systemic shift and to use critical intelligence on pertinent issues. In plain speak, I create spaces where the right story can take people to the next life-giving future that they're longing for. So that's what I think a story activist is, and that's what I thought I was doing when the GIZ here in Germany invited me to work with a group of Afghani civil servants in November last year in Thailand. So me and my colleagues, we went and we decided, even though the brief was a storytelling training, that we would put leadership and storytelling together because that would help story get in the door. But from the very first moment, we hit all possible barriers you can imagine. Race, ethnicity, gender, religion, concepts, you know, did they know the same even leadership concepts that we knew, worldview, everything you can possibly think of. It felt like we were stuck. No, it was worse than that. It felt like we were sinking. So on day three, we had assigned people to do a little trio storytelling exercise, and we noticed that two out of the four groups weren't doing the exercise, so we went over to find out why not. And what we discovered was that a suicide bomber had blown themselves up just at that moment in Kabul in a public building, and they were all watching the footage on their smartphone. What do you do when war has come into the room? Because with that war came all the stories of trauma that were in that group. And so we just decided to be with those stories. The next day, they went off into a break, and we went into a team meeting, a hard one. You know, there's no word in Dottie for the way I was trying to talk about story to them. I don't mean stories of children and being around the fire. I mean the way that the human mind is patterned with and through stories, and how we make sense and meaning of our world through stories. 
I wanted them to know that their leadership would be enhanced if they studied storytelling. And then, in fact, the stories they were holding of leadership were already influencing how they saw their role now. I wanted them to know that their reality isn't the reality. And I finally came to my own personal bottom line. What do I want people to know? I want them to know we live in a story, and that means we can change it. And finally, I said to the team, I feel like I'm in a, a, a place of total professional surrender. I don't know if you've ever been in that place. I felt like I had to give away everything that I assumed, that I was a good facilitator, that I was supposed to be helpful, that we were going to meet what the client thought they wanted. That story was magical. And I said to my colleagues, you know what, I don't have to like these guys, but I have to love them enough to be in this work with them until the end. And so that's what we did. And it made all the difference. Moving into the story with them began to shift the story. We live in a story and that means we can change it. So what story are we living in right now? It's good to ask that question because the story that you're living in tends to be the story that you're living into. We've come to the end of the story of unending economic growth. Most of our institutions are shaking. The Europe we are living in is seeming to be a mass of conflicting stories. But that's not news. In fact, it's not even new. It's the same everywhere. We're at that time where we're testing how's the individual and the collective story going to move forward together. It's the time when we all have that sense, we need a new story, but what one is it? Well, life is giving us a bit of a push to find out what it is because there are people on the move. There are people walking up the roads. There are people showing up in our train stations. There are people looking for home. In fact, I'm one of those people on the move. So last week I was in Prague and I was supporting a scouting conference and because I knew I was going, I put a little note on Facebook saying, hey, I'm going to be in Prague, is there any way I can be helpful? You see that old helpful doesn't die so easily. And out of that came two experiments and one of them was storytelling around the refugee situation. And so 60 people showed up at a cafe to listen to refugee stories. That may sound like a very simple thing, but while you see signs like this here in Germany, in the Czech Republic, the story around refugees is very, very different. So this is what I saw coming into the airport. But if you're a refugee, it's not a safe place to be, the Czech Republic. The story that's going around there is a story of fear. So I wondered about this particular story of fear, since obviously somebody knows about storytelling in the tourism area. And so I began to ask my Czech friends, what about fear? And they told me about their history, 1968. The Soviets came. 1948, the Communist Party was there. 1938, the Nazis. And before that, stories of empire. In fact, they have been overwhelmed and they've been unable to defend themselves many times. I wondered about the root of this story. And I found it hiding in plain sight right in the middle of Prague. So this is a picture of the old astronomical clock that's in the middle of the town square. And every hour on the hour, this story plays itself out. So here on the second to the right, you see death. Death starts this play by ringing his bell. And then the other three figures start nodding their heads like this, meaning like, no, don't go there. And here you can see what people in the medieval time were worried about. On the far left is a man holding a mirror. He stands for vanity. The man next to him is holding a money bag. He stands for greed. But it's the guy on the very far right I'm most interested in because the guy wearing the turban he stands for the danger of becoming mesmerized, or you might say, overwhelmed by other cultures. The old story is playing itself out almost every hour of the day, every day. So the new story can't arise because the old story is coloring what we see of as the future, and that old story is being fed every day at the breakfast table in so many places. But what story do we choose to be in? If we know we can choose, if we know we could choose a story to live in, that would be a different thing. So are we facing the hordes who are coming to overrun our country, to ruin things, to take everything from us? Or are we in fact facing the most elegant distribution of talent and skill the planet has ever seen? Which story will we choose to live in? Will we actually see the face of the other in the people that are facing us, and what would happen if we actually listened to each other's stories in order to find out what the new story should be. So here's the thing. 
Our stories can hold us down or our stories can lift us up. We get to choose. So our stories are a way that we hold all of our wisdom and all of our pain. Our stories are the way we make sense and meaning of the world. So they're our lens on the world and they're also the way we interact with the world. We have a unique lens, each of us, because each of us has experienced a different story. And we often take our stories as being the truth, even though somebody else has had a different experience. And we wonder why people don't see the world in the same way we do. But how can they? Because they're living in another story. We make sense and meaning through our story and we crave meaning. So in a very direct fashion, our stories create our behavior and our actions in the world. They're like a chemical reaction that's kind of running behind everything at all times. They hold our wisdom and our experience. So you might say that our stories are the library of humanity. And if that's true, then I'm a librarian in the library of humanity. And I've been noticing about our stories that they each have a resonance. You know, a story is like a tuning fork. And our stories of fear have a very low-level resonance. They're heavy. They're sticky. And they weigh down the possibility of looking for a different future. And I think that humanity has been playing on the fear shelf for far too long. So what do we choose to do? We could follow our most deepest longings. This is a little post-it note that came from a woman in one of my more, more difficult sessions when we asked, what do you hope comes from this time together? She wrote, I hope for us to come home together. I heard that as a call from the heart of humanity. I hope for us to come home together. So what can each of us do? What could we do that would build the bridge to the new story? What could you do? What could I do? Well, the first thing you could do is to take back the power of your own story. So here's my suitcase. I call it my portable public intervention. So when I'm wheeling my suitcase, one side says, take back the power of your story. The other side says, what question could change your life? And when I catch people looking at my suitcase, ha, I go, intervention. You've seen it. Now what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so the good news for all of us is that Right now, story is the new black, you know. We call everybody a storyteller. Politicians, musicians, authors, advertisers. If you're human, you are a storyteller. So it means now is a good time to get good at it. And it's time to be diligent and vigilant. Be aware of this most important real estate on the planet between your ears. Be careful and awake to what comes in there, says my friend Paul Costello, who works in Washington, D.C., and question what's already in there. And here's some ways that you can do that, some practical tips. First one, be more curious. What are the practices that would help you to be curious? Because when you have curiosity, you don't have as much judgment. So what are the personal practices you use to host yourself? How do you stay present? Do you meditate? Do you swim? Do you pet the dog? Do you play with children? What do you do? Do you tell bad jokes? What do you do to stay more present? Practice that and be diligent about it. Number two, if you want to be a good storyteller, then you need to be a good story listener. There's so much information deluging us today that we've most of us forgotten how to be good listeners because we want to kind of defend ourselves from what's out there. But you know what? It's the listener who plays a big role in the story and what it will become. So could we witness each other into our collective and our individual potential? Good listening can take us there, and listening is one of the greatest gifts. And next, be aware of who tells the story. Be a storyteller yourself. Look for those stories of hope, for goodwill, for good teamwork, for people working well together. Don't let the media tell all of the stories. We need to go and propagate the stories we want to live in. And even more than that, tell stories to your children. It says in Danish, is anybody going to tell us a good night story? Tell them stories because they're hungry for it and pattern their imagination, feed their imagination before you turn them over to technology or the entertainment industry where the stories are already made up for them. It's imagination that's going to take us into the future. And also, could you learn some practice to help us share our stories together? Get good at participatory practice, and even more, get good at questions. So, we have a very low question literacy in the world. What questions should we keep, or what stories should we keep telling? What stories should we stop telling? What stories should we start telling because they could be hopeful? The main thing is, we can choose, and we should choose and be conscious about it. And last, my tip for you is to ask yourself the question, 
What is mine to do? I think this is the biggest question that's out there right at the moment. Where is the intersection of your love and your skill best put to use for the rest of us on behalf of the world? I figured out some of what is mine to do, and that is to look for stories that actually need to be helped back into life right now. In 2011, I began working on the story of Denmark going bankrupt in 1813 because I could see it had a pattern in it of how to move from crisis to possibility. In 1814, Denmark instituted universal schooling for boys and girls, the first country in the world to do so, because the king said, we might be poor, but we don't have to be stupid as well. <laughs> Interesting monarch. But out of that, we learned a really important thing. We learned the concept of Trojan mice. Now, you know what a Trojan horse is? Ah, uh -huh, think small. Because the teachers in this story who were trained to take education across the country stayed a loosely connected network, and they helped to make step change. Out of this point in time in history came the values that are still working in Denmark today. And the queen was known, the queen, current queen, Margareta, said, what if all disharmony and wars in the world are because of the conversations that did not happen? I think stories are one way to take us into those conversations, and that wa that's why what I'm most interested in and what's mine to do is to look at the story of peace at the heart of the European Union and to wake it up again. Because I'm carrying this question, what if Europe would decide to embody the story of peace and be a force for good on this planet? What if? So 2016, I'm starting in that direction. I feel compelled to do so. So how far would you go for a good story? I hope you will go the distance. Our humanity needs you. Our planet needs you. The stories that have yet to be told need you. So may you all be story activists for our better future together. Thank you.